My name is Don Dodge, and I am the summer interim pastor while Pastor Jeremy is just taking some time off uh, for medical leave this, this summer. And we are in a series that I have fallen in love with. It's called Unexpected Stories. And um, this, this series has been just about a lot of different stories within the Bible. And I'm trying to get it to go to the next one. There it is. All right. Um, today's story, though, it's a little bit different than what we've been talking about. Today's story really covers a topic, a question that probably almost everybody in here has wrestled with, and some of us wrestle with it big time. Where is God when we suffer? Where is he? Where is God when the baby dies unexpectedly? Where is God when the husband or wife suddenly decides to leave the family? Where is he when a drunk driver kills a nine-year-old girl? which happened to one of our youth who um, is now you know, grown up from our early days in youth ministry, just happened a week and a half ago. Where is God in the midst of all of this? And we, we ask, if God exists, how could he let this kind of thing happen? And so what happens is many of us doubt. And, and we know that there are brilliant people, people like Richard Dawkins or Neil deGrasse Tyson and um, the New Atheists, who they, in their writings, they say things uh, that, you know, pain and suffering is clear evidence that there is no God. And frankly, I read some of that stuff, and man, on first glance, that stuff's persuasive. And they're not bad people. I just disagree. But they're persuasive sometimes. But then if we choose to read other brilliant people, people like the late C.S. Lewis, or there's this guy named Alvin, Alvin Planiga. If you ever want to read him, if you can't sleep, he is the guy. <laughs> because he's seriously, by atheist Christians in the world, they say this guy is one of the most brilliant philosophers of our time, and that means you can't understand anything he says. Um, then there's a guy that you can find in any Christian bookstore, Tim Keller. These guys, they're guys, and there's a lot of women out there too, sorry. Uh, these people, they offer compelling evidence that God speaks, that his presence is in the midst of pain and suffering. So who's right? Because that's a question that we struggle with so much. I wanted to share a little bit of my story today. Um, I didn't grow up in a church in high school. I was invited to attend a youth group function where um, I heard the story of Jesus. And I hadn't heard it much in my life, but it pierced me to my core. And I, I, I was told that if, if Jesus was inviting me to follow him, I was compelled to say yes. And I did. And that night, the direction of my life changed. And God seemed so real to me. And about a year later, I met my high school sweetheart. We started dating. I graduated high school, went to college, became a biblical studies major, knowing I was going into the ministry. And uh, the summer, we got married the summer before my junior year in college. And so we'd been married almost two years as I was approaching graduation from college. And um, I was about eight weeks away. And my plans were to go to seminary after graduation and just continue this, this path. We were, so we were married about two years, and on Tuesday, March 2nd, 1993, we had this amazing night with our youth ministry that night, and I was serving as a part-time youth pastor, and uh, my wife, as we got home, um, my wife Jennifer suddenly expressed that she was dizzy, and she started breathing hard, and she was gasping for air, and then her lips started turning blue, and she passed out, and obviously, I immediately called 911. The ambulance arrived within four minutes. They loaded her up, I jumped in the front seat, and they took us to the hospital. The doctors, as we came in, they directed me immediately to the waiting room, which weirdly, there was not a single person in the waiting room in West Palm Beach, Florida. Even to this day, I know that it was God just allowing me some time uh, with him because uh, I, I was in the waiting room alone. I, I realized I didn't have a ride home because I rode in the ambulance, so I called my, my pastor, who was my boss, but he was also a very good friend of mine, and I told him what had happened. And as I waited for him to come, I just prayed. What else can you do, right? And what's really interesting is that night, I can honestly say I had more faith that God was going to heal her than I have in, in any time in my life when it comes to having faith about anything. Pastor Scott arrived, and we prayed together, and we waited. Finally, <coughs> excuse me, finally the doctors came out, and they told me that my wife appeared to have a massive blood clot in her lungs. 
And, and, and I'm shaking my head. And he says, I don't think you understand. I, I, there's a good chance your wife's not going to make it. It was like a punch in the stomach. Because you're like, God, what, what's going on here? I mean, this isn't supposed to happen. It's not supposed to be this way. Where, where are you? Scott left me for a few minutes to make some phone calls and get people praying. I fell to my knees in the waiting room, and I just started sobbing and crying, pleading for God to heal Jennifer. I declared every spiritual cliche I had ever heard because I figured maybe if I could say just the right words, God would choose to heal her. When I walked in, uh, the doctors came out. They, they told me that she's not going to make it. And so I walked into that you know, ER room where she was, tubes all over her, and I just cried and prayed, and I was like standing in front of her, God, you can still heal her right now but he didn't. He didn't. The doctors came to me and they asked for permission to take her off the tubes and turn off the life support. And here's how I'm 21 years old, having to make the decision to allow my wife to die. What's going on, Lord? I felt so completely alone. Pastor Scott was there, the doctors, the nurses, they were comforting me, but I still, I felt so abandoned. After the funeral, I had to go back to school and I finished the last eight weeks of my, my bachelor's degree. And I just, I was overwhelmed with grief the whole time. But see, then, as grief, I don't want to say it subsided because it didn't, along with grief, anger set in. And I just started getting angry. I was so angry at God for allowing this to happen. Jesus healed people, right? He healed people. And didn't the Bible say that if you believe, You will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. And I would pray, God, I did believe. I did my part. You didn't. I was so angry. And then one minute, you know, I'd be angry at God or or I'd even be doubting his existence. And then the next minute, I would be praying, God, please take away this incredible pain. And now I had a degree in religion and I wasn't even sure God existed. So, of course, I didn't go to seminary right away, and I I resigned from my youth ministry, and I I just, I moved back home and just tried to figure out what was going on, just try to heal a little bit before I could make any decisions. I mean, have you ever felt completely abandoned by God? Because if you say yes, I say me too. Have you ever asked the question, is God real? And if he is, why would he allow this to happen? When C.S. Lewis He is one of my absolute favorite Christian writers. And towards the end of his life, his ministry, his wife died of cancer, and they'd only been married a couple of years. And he wrote this quote in one of his last books. I'm not sure if this isn't working, but there it is. Oh, now we went too far. (laughs) C.S. Lewis said this. He said, where is God? Go to him when your need is desperate, when all other help is vain, and what do you find? A door slammed in your face, and a sound bolting and double bolting on the inside. And after that, silence. I am so grateful to C.S. Lewis for his authenticity in writing this sentence, or this paragraph, because in the midst of my grief, he put into words exactly how I was feeling. So why do we suffer? Why why does God seem so distant? They're questions that we all face at some time in our lives. And while I know that this question cannot be solved in a 30-minute sermon, I know that. That's why we're going two hours today. (laughs) Just kidding. I'm just kidding. (sighs) Had to lighten it a bit. I was about to cry. Um, (laughs) I know it well. In a two-hour sermon, it's not going to be solved in that time either. But this is my goal for today. My hope is that um, all of us, if you're in this situation, if you are struggling with doubt, you are struggling, how could God allow suffering like he does? That today helps you begin a journey of just trusting him in the midst of the suffering. I hope that today you, you can begin the process, the journey of trusting that God is good and he is worthy to be trusted and he has a plan. I'll finish this, my story in a little bit, but I want to jump into a story that's so much better and bigger than mine. It's the unexpected story for today. It comes from a, the book of John, chapter 11. Many of you have heard this story. It's a story that happens in the midst of a funeral. 
So the scripture will be on the screen. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Now, this is the Mary whose brother Lazarus, uh, this, this Mary whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. Two sisters are here worried about their brother. He's sick and things don't look good. Now, we'll find out in a minute. They had a relationship with Jesus. They knew him well, their families. Uh, Jesus knew the entire family. And so they knew that Jesus could heal their brother. But Jesus wasn't anywhere near. So they had somebody run and they just sent for Jesus, said, get here as quick as you can. My brother's dying. And then it says in verse four. Sorry. <laughs> you got it? Ah, I did it again. It works, but it's like three seconds behind. Sorry. So it says, when Jesus heard this, that Lazarus was dying and that the sisters were calling for him, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. Now, it says in verse 5, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, what did he do? He stayed where he was two more days. What? I'm not understanding, Jesus, Lord, what's going on? Something's going on, obviously, that we don't see. There's got to be some reason that he would do this because this truly is an unexpected story. Why did he do this? Jesus hears his friend sick and he doesn't go to him. Jesus says that the story is not going to end in death, yet two days later, it says in verse 14, <laughs> there you go, thank you, Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. So Jesus tells his disciples plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let's go to him. So Lazarus is sick and Jesus waits. Says that the story won't end in death, yet Lazarus has died. And Jesus says he's glad he wasn't there. And if that is not a head scratcher, nothing is. So the disciples had no idea what was going on. Thank goodness, because neither do I and neither do we. I mean, you're wondering what's going on. They make the one to two day journey to Bethany. Then in verse 17, it says, on his arrival... Jesus found that Lazarus had already been dead in the tomb for four days. So, <coughs> excuse me, basically, Lazarus had died about the time that Jesus was told that Lazarus was sick. Four days of grief and worry and not understanding by the family and friends. You know, if I didn't know the whole story, this one would make me pretty mad. Why was Jesus waiting? Why didn't he go heal? I mean... This is so different from the other stories that, about Jesus healing sick people and stuff because, you know, he would heal them right away. Sometimes he would even speak and they were far away and were healed immediately. Yet Jesus did none of that in this situation. Why not? Verse 20. It says, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet Jesus, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. See, in her mind and in everybody's mind, Jesus was late. He was late. You, you can imagine her heartache. You've healed so many people, Jesus, people you don't even know, but you know us, you know our family, yet you did nothing. This story is so honest. Jesus, if you had only been here, everything would be okay. Lazarus would still be alive. Why did you allow this to happen? Where were you? And then verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know, he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Now, she is expressing a common Jewish belief of the time. The Jews believe that at the end of time, at the end of days, God would resurrect all of his people, namely Jews, and they would be his people in the, in the, the new kingdom, in the kingdom come. And so she is thinking, Jesus is referencing that, and she says, yes, Lord, I know. I know he will be raised again. But he, Jesus was saying so much more. Because look in verse 25. It says, Jesus said to her, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Martha, do you believe this? See, the, the Jews, they believed in that final resurrection. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. I am the means 
to that resurrection. He is the one who overcomes death. Now, this passage right here is one of the famous, in theological worlds, this is one of the famous I am sayings of Jesus. When Jesus says, he says, I am, he is referencing what we talked about a couple of weeks ago, that name that God showed Moses at the burning bush. I am that I am. Jesus is identifying with I am in this moment. He says, I am the resurrection. I am the life. And then he asked Martha, do you believe this? And do you believe in me? And of course, verse 27, she says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are Messiah. I believe you are the son of God who's come into the world. You, (coughs) excuse me, you are the Messiah. I trust you. You are from God. See, she knew Jesus was special. She just didn't know how special. And then she ran and got her sister Mary. And in verse 32, it says, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, just like her sister, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. How could you let this happen, Jesus? In verse 33, it says, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and he was troubled. Where have you laid him, they asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And then Jesus wept. Jesus wept. This is so interesting to me because he was the one who chose to be late. He was the one who uh, chose not to heal Lazarus when when he could. And he's in the midst of this scene of people weeping and crying and being upset because of the death of Lazarus, somebody he loved. And he weeps too. Why? Why did he weep? The text doesn't tell us for sure. You wish it did. I'm like, Luke, or John, sorry, this one's John. (laughs) Luke was last time. John, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? Why was he weeping? I'm going to tell you why I think he was weeping, because I really think this paints a picture of the way Jesus continually reveals himself. I think that when Jesus arrived at Lazarus' funeral, he was deeply grieved. He wept because of the broken hearts of his friends. And he wept because God created people to live, not die. God created us to live. Death grieves the heart of God. It does. Death was never part of the plan. Death was a a result of our rebellion as human beings. It was the result of sin and selfishness and brokenness. God's plan was and is and always will be life. His plan is life. Jesus came to restore life. He is the I am who is the resurrection. But in the meantime, until that day, we're surrounded by death. And Jesus wept. Verse 36. Then the Jews said, Oh, see how he loved him. But then some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? I am so glad that that question was recorded because that's my question. I mean, Jesus, thank you for weeping and thank you for all, but why did you let him die in the first place? When Jennifer died, that was my question. Why did you let her die? Where were you? You could have healed her. All you had to do is speak your word and she would have been healed, but you didn't. And let me tell you, one of the things that I love about this story, because there's so much in this rich story, but do you realize that Jesus never condemned, rebuked, or told these people, stop questioning me? Never. Martha Martha and Mary, where were you? You weren't here. Jesus, our brother would have, he would be alive if you weren't here. That doubt, that questioning, Jesus never said, stop it. Don't question me. Never. See, because God is a big boy, and he can handle our questions. And our questions don't change anything when it comes to he is the I am. But our questions do change something in us because they help us search for truth. They help us search for what is real. They help change our perspective. And I think God, I was kind of told as a young kid, uh, uh, early, I say young kid because, you know, I'm in my late 40s now, but uh, in high school when I became a follower of Christ, I kind of grew up in a tradition where you didn't question, you didn't ask, why would God do that? And we were told not to a lot. 
And I think that was damaging because it is in the questions that I think that if we're searching them, especially within the community of faith, people who love us and are willing to walk and journey with us and challenge us, I think we come out the other side much better than if we didn't ask the questions. And then the story, con- whoa, goodness, sorry. The story continues in verse 38. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, I love this. Again, honesty. The sister of the dead man says, by this time there's a bad odor, for he has been there for four days. The King James Version of the Bible says this best. Martha says, it's been four days, Lord. He stinketh. I don't know why. Because this is, this is like a holy moment. This is not supposed to be funny. But every time I read that, Lord, he stinketh. I just crack up. So thank you for not making me think I'm just this insensitive jerk because you laugh too. So we're, we're all bad. Uh, <laughs> and then in verse 40, <laughs> it says, Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? They hadn't seen it yet, right? He says this, Lazarus is dead. Everybody's weeping. Didn't I tell you you'd see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Jesus looked up and says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I, kn- I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of everybody standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. Bottom line, Jesus is making it clear right now. What's about to happen? It is from God. This is a God thing. This is a God moment right now. And what you're about to see is going to identify Jesus' I am identity, his identity with the I am. Verse 43. So when he said this, and I can't do it like a man, like manly voice, but Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. <laughs> and the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. You're like, this is a crazy story. The guy's been dead for four days. And all of a sudden, he's walking out of the tomb, wrapped in his tomb clothes, and he doesn't stinketh. (laughs) He's alive. You can just imagine what was going through everybody's minds. I mean, Martha had affirmed her faith in Jesus as Messiah and the Son of God. But this, this right here, this was not expected. Nobody was expecting this one. And the crowds were torn. Gotta love this. Again, doubt. In the midst of this experience that is beyond all experiences, it says in the next verse, some some doubted and some believed. And those who doubted thought that Jesus was trying to tear people away from the traditions that were sacred to them. And so some of them said, this man needs to be killed because this is spooky, what's going on. He cannot be trusted. And as a result, many started leading down this path that would end up crucifying Jesus. Raising Lazarus from the dead, as you could imagine, changed everything in his ministry and in the lives of those around him. And I love this story because it shows that Jesus has the power over death. He has the power over death. He, Jesus is revealed in this passage as the I am, the great I am. But I also love this story because it also admits that we suffer. It doesn't deny it. It doesn't say only bad people suffer. It just says we suffer. And I can't stop thinking about the question, why did did Lazarus die in the first place? I mean, that question keeps coming back to me. Why did he have to experience sickness and health? Why did his family have to suffer grief and worry and all of that? Why did they still have to walk through the storm? And why do we so often still have to walk through the storm when God is on on our side? I don't know. That one's not an easy answer. Definitely not going to be solved in a 30-minute sermon. But see, here's what I do know, and here's where I think the hope is found. Jesus walked through the storm too. Jesus did not have to die, but he did. Jesus did not have to be betrayed, but he was. What I love is that God doesn't Watch our suffering from far away. He walks right along with us as the one who suffered himself. In the midst of suffering, he declared who he is. I, in the midst of suffering, he declared who he is. I am the resurrection and the life. 
He is faithful and good and true. He sees the end. And guess what? It ends well. Amen. There is hope. In that hope, he says, trust me. And it's our choice whether we trust him or not. He says, trust me that even when, I, even when you feel distant, I am present. He says, trust that I am good even when everything around you seems like it's going really, really bad. He says, trust that I know, when I, that, trust that I know what I'm doing even when you have no idea what I'm doing. By the way, that is the definition of faith. Trusting that God knows what he's doing and that he is good even when we have no idea what he's doing. In the midst of unanswered questions, trust God that he is good and is in control and that he is walking with us through through the valley. Soon after Jennifer had died, um, I decided to go to counseling and I wanted to make sure that her death didn't ruin me and um, because I was struggling uh, in faith and if God was real, I wanted to believe. I just wasn't sure he was real. If he wasn't real, as cliche as it sounds, I wanted to become better and not bitter. And so I started going to counseling. My counselor said two things that changed my life, and I won't even charge you for these two things this morning. <laughs> One, she said that as a result of my experience, doubt was always going to be a part of my story. She said, you will always doubt. You're 21 years old. Your wife passes away. You are a fairly young Christian. You're going to doubt for the rest of your life. Just know that. Make it part of your story because God's going to use that. And that's unbelievable that God could use doubt for his kingdom. But let me tell you, he has. I can't tell you how many people have, I've either been in a small group with or um, just have shared my story from stage and they've come up and said, you don't know what it means to know that there is a pastor who doubts yet follows with his whole heart. And I'm like, I can't imagine that's an encouragement, but thank you very much because it's true. It really has helped. But the the second thing that the counselor told me also, and this probably is what changed my life the most, she encouraged me to be committed to a church family because she said this, I wasn't sure that God existed, but if he did, I would find him in the midst of his family, of his people. She said, I would find uh, faith, and I would, my faith would be restored as I shared my life with others and they shared their life with me. When I saw God working in you, that would help my faith be restored. And she was so right. In fact, that's why I'm here today, because I made a conscious choice that said, I don't know if there's a God, but I'm gonna be a part of a church family anyway. And watching God's, story evolved in the midst of these people, watching him do things, them sharing with me, I can't even tell you how that changed my faith and and helped restore my faith because God works in us and he works in us together. About two years later, I was at a church event and I met this incredible girl, Raylan. Now, as we talked, we really started getting to know each other and she invited me to a Monday night football event in the singles ministry. That is an awesome first date. All right. (laughs) Now, when she invited me, how does a normal guy respond to a gorgeous girl that he wants to go out with? How does he respond when she invites him to a date? Yeah, however you're thinking that a normal good guy responds, I didn't do that. (laughs) All right. What I did instead is I went, I reached into my back pocket to pull out my calendar because this was before phones had calendars to see if I was available. (laughs) Now, I know that's dumb now. Back then, I thought I was being considerate because I didn't want to tell her I was available and then have to back out. So in my consideration... Of course, she thought I was blowing her off because I didn't have my calendar with me. And I was like, oh, no, can I call you later and, and tell you if I can go? And I know many of you ladies are saying, she should have dumped him right then. <laughs> yes, she should have. She should have. That is why I know there's a God because <laughs> she didn't. She's a saint. 
So she lets me borrow her pen so that I could write down her phone number and proving that God has an immense sense of humor. As I'm writing down her phone number, I promise this is gospel truth. This is not a preacher story. This is real. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> I'm writing down her phone number and her pen explodes all over my hand. She knows this is it. This is it. I mean, <laughs> there's no going, going from this. But I didn't care because I really did want to... To, to go out on this date, I just really didn't want to let her down by having to cancel. So I, I, you know, I went home, not touching the steering wheel with two wheels, or two, two hands because it's covered in ink. Get home, look at my calendar, Humphrey, first thing I do, I call her up and say, I would like to go. And you will not believe this. After all of that, she paid for my dinner the first night. I know. Now, you have to understand something. Give me a little grace. I had a bachelor's degree in religion and wasn't sure if there was a God. That don't pay the bills, okay? <laughs> I was broker than any time in my entire life. So when she asked me, hey, can we go out to dinner beforehand? I, I, there was a silence on the phone because I knew I had like a dollar to my name and I wasn't getting paid for like two weeks. I was eating cornflakes and green beans. That was what I, that's where I was. I mean, it was like... I was so poor, and so she said, we'll go Dutch, and I was thinking, I can get water, I can get free bread, and, but then she, she paid, and she is a saint, amen, amen I know, <laughs> yeah, you can give her a hand, I'm feeling really low right now, so I, I need to, I need to pep this up. Uh, whoo. All of a sudden, people are like, why did we hire this guy for the summer? <laughs> now, seriously, that night began the great journey of my life. We have been married 22 years. We've had two girls, and we adopted a teenage girl early in our marriage who has now made us grandparents. And so we are like the youngest, coolest grandparents who live really far away from there. <laughs> They're grandkids. But see, what, what's amazing is when Jennifer died, I never thought I could be happy again. I never thought I would find happiness. The grief, the doubt, the anger. I mean, it had, it had consumed my whole life. How could it not? It takes time. But in God's time, he brought beauty in the midst of awfulness. He bought, brought beauty in the midst of pain. See, death and suffering do exist for a time. They do. But even in the midst of pain and suffering, God is in the restoring business and he continually works to redeem the pain and to bring beauty in the midst of that pain. But it's our choice. Do we trust him or do we not? One of my favorite verses, which so many in here have heard, but I'm telling you, this meant the world to me. It was Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who've been called according to his purpose. In all things, when the good happens... God works it out for the good of his kingdom. And when the bad happens and we go through pain and suffering, he works it for good. It doesn't mean that it was good. Jennifer's death was terrible. Death is terrible. Pain and suffering is not the plan. But in the midst of pain and suffering, he can bring beauty out of that that, had, that could never even been possible had we not gone through it. It doesn't make it all okay. It just shows God's graciousness in the midst of a world that is full of pain and suffering. Because his plan is life. He works through inevitable pain. He brings beauty. It's even in Jesus' death, think about it. God made the worst thing imaginable, the cross, the path to the most beautiful thing imaginable, eternity with him and with each other. The cross, awful. God takes it and brings beauty out of it. Our salvation. Amazing. Jesus said to Lazarus' sisters, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, the one who follows me, they will live even though they die. Death is no longer hopeless. Suffering and pain are no longer worthless. God can take the worst that life has to offer and he can bring beauty and good from it. Praise the Lord. In Jesus, we find life even in death. In Jesus, we find hope even in suffering. Because in Jesus, this is not the end. 
Amen. This is not it. When Jesus invites us to follow him, he's not inviting us to be free of, or, or to have a life that is free of suffering. He's inviting us to live with the hope that it will not always be this way. We might suffer. We might suffer a lot. Many people in the world right now are suffering because they follow Jesus. And he is saying, but have hope. It will not always be this way. He's with us in the pain. Are you wondering where God is? He's walking with you right in the midst of the pain. He's inviting you to trust him to bring meaning to it, meaning to this, all this stuff. Are you wondering where God is in the pain? He's, he's walking right alongside you, helping you find healing in his family, the church. And he's inviting you to experience hope that all will be made right one day. So the question is, do you have that hope? Because you can. It it doesn't mean you're going to get it tomorrow. It's a journey. And God wants to walk with you in that journey. That that journey, that's the reason Jesus came and suffered and died and rose again. So that you could walk alongside him in the journey with hope that it won't always be this way. I want to pray in just a second. But I would ask, just so that we can have a moment of of just reflection between you and God. Can everybody just bow their heads just for a minute? Because I want to pray for you. And before I pray, I wanted to ask, if you are struggling to trust God in the midst of suffering, without looking around, I, I just so that I can pray for you, would you just raise your hand? I'm not going to ask you to come forward or anything. I just want to pray for you, literally. There are several people in here in the midst of suffering. Oh, thank you. A, a lot of people. God, I want to pray for these people specifically. In the midst of pain, it really is hard to hear your voice, and it really feels sometimes like we're so distant from you. Help us to trust your promise that you're not, that our emotions, are, are they can really deceive us sometimes into thinking that we're all alone. But the reality is we have a church family around us, and we have you. Help us to have hope that it is not always going to be this way. In the midst of the grief, Help us grow to trust you and to walk with you and to know that in the end, you make all things good and true and right. So help these people who raise their hand. Help us, all of us in this room, to learn to trust you and say yes and follow you and to have that faith when we don't know how it's going to work out. In Jesus' name, amen. Before I'm done, though, I wanted, to, um, I wanted to show you something. It is not, pain and suffering and death are not journeys you can take by yourself. If you do, it will, mesh, it will mess you up. I have learned that so much that when I've excluded myself and put a little circle around myself, that's when I hurt the most and I, I am deceived the most into thinking that God doesn't care, God isn't real. And There are a couple of books that have really changed my life and have been powerful. I just wanted to point them out to you. Um, that, this doesn't take away the power of the church family, but you know, sometimes it really helps. And the book on the left, No Doubt, by John Ortberg, is a, is a pr- it's not an easy read because doubt and faith and suffering and all that kind of stuff, not easy topics. Definitely approachable. It's such a good book. I have done more men's small groups with that book than any other book in my life. The book on the right by Timothy Keller is a little harder, just to let you know. Um, <laughs> excuse me, I, and it sounds so weird. I was reading this morning, and a thought hit me, and it was too late to put, this, put it on the slide. But some of you have heard of the Christian singer Stephen Curtis Chapman, and his daughter was killed by a car that ran over her that his son was driving. You can imagine the grief this family's experiencing. He released a book about two years ago. It's his story. That book is the better than these two when it comes to hearing in a story form the journey of of God making beauty out of awful. And so, um, you know, Stephen Curtis Chapman just looked that one up on Amazon or something, and uh, he he only has written one book, so it's not going to be hard to find. Um, (laughs) What? It's in the Algoma Library, by the way. So after this, let's rush there and get it. Whoever gets it first. (laughs) All right. For all of us in here, before we sing, Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He wants us 
to say yes to him. He wants us to allow him to just begin doing something in us that is so good. Maybe you have been hurt and you are a follower of Jesus and you're struggling. Maybe you've never chosen to follow Jesus and you're just struggling. Jesus invites you today to say yes to follow him. I realize if you're struggling with suffering and pain and death and those kinds of things that it's not just a, oh, I'm going to check a box. It's a journey. I would ask. I would love to help you walk through your journey. You know, you, you, we talked about the connection card earlier. If you would like to just me to contact you, email or phone, or if you would like to talk about you know, following Jesus or why God would allow this or how do you deal with your doubts, would you mark that on the connection card? You can drop it in the offering when it goes by or, or to that, the desk outside uh, where you can pick up your gift if you're new, that kind of thing. I would love to help you. We are in this together. Let's pray together one more time, and then we're, we'll sing. Jesus, thank you that we are not hopeless. Help us follow you because it is impossible to do this on our own. We do need you. But I also pray that you help us to step out of our own life and to look around and see those who are suffering and in need and help us love on them because we are a family, your family. Amen.